and uh, good morning, everybody. It's an absolute pleasure uh, to, to be here. I'm here to make you all feel a little bit uncomfortable about the R word. Um, when I arrived in Cork in 2015, one of my earliest conversations left me worried that moving here from Miami was a mistake. I had raised the question of race and racism in Ireland generally, and Cork in particular, and was abruptly told that these were all USA issues that I should now leave behind. I was left scratching my head when I learned that at that time, the university had no data collected on race or ethnicity. We don't see race. The university accepts everyone, went one response. A lot has changed since then, but the real impact of racism is evident at many levels of Irish society. Granted that race is not biological, we are all the same in that regard, but we do know through our histories and so social realities that race has a very real impact on our lives. I was born and raised in Glasgow, where issues of race were rarely talked about, but no matter how many times I've worn a kilt, there's always someone who asks that dreaded question, but where are you really from? The way race organizes society teaches us about the structural foundations of social power. Even though we long ago divided our worlds between East and West and North and South, all is not lost. Now more than ever before, we are having an open debate and discussion right here in Ireland, in Cork. This pandemic has been a great teacher to us. It has illustrated that there is a pandemic on a pandemic. Black, Asian, minority, ethnic Irish folks are physically and mentally burdened, but they're also burdened not just with COVID-19, but also racism. The Irish Network Against Racism in its 2021 findings registered a total number of incidents reaching 404. The system also recorded 154 criminal incidents, including racist assaults and a record 90 reports of illegal discrimination. The report is a catalog of ghastly accounts of racist abuse suffered by people all over this country. One incident reports that the doors of two families of Middle Eastern and Asian background have been frequently kicked by a group of 15 to 20 teenagers late at night. The children run upstairs in fear when they hear the door being kicked. The families fear for their children and cannot let them out alone. And another, where two traveler boys were constantly racially abused in different ways, such as racist slurs, online threatening and bullying, the oldest boy was physically attacked from behind on school grounds, where he was left with a cut under his eye. The assault was witnessed by a large group of students. The largest group of crime reports, 404 in total, came from South Asian, Chinese, and other Asian people. South Asian and Chinese or other Asians each reported 32% of all crimes reported in 2021. Racism has a demonstrable impact on the lives of those targeted. An analysis of the data on impact shows that there is a psychological impact on those targeted, impact on their social connectedness, and financial impacts through, for example, increased costs or lost income. 115 reports, 88% were described as having a psychological impact on the victim. I am scared to go to the city at night. My daughter was six at the time. I don't allow them to play outside, and if I do, I have to be at the window. I know she gets nervous. I am personally struck by these accounts as someone whose university's office is alarmed since a death threat in 2017, and as someone who fought my university system on institutional racism since I joined it in 2015. I am pleased to say that an informal resolution has been reached this summer with University College Cork. This pandemic has highlighted many subjects we avoided, especially race. Being vulnerable and disempowered have effects, but many of us carry privileges and can access networks or social statuses that allow us not to see certain matters. But COVID-19 has left us all vulnerable. Whether rich or poor, white or black, we have all had to deal with lockdown, the uncertainty of death, and all sorts of curbs on our freedoms. The May 25, 2020 death of George Floyd by police brutality left us all stunned a death that ignited a worldwide reaction with people taking to the streets and calling for action against racism. It has sparked a reckoning with our past. We've come face to face with how racism still has a hold in society, and the stories we've heard have been painful. 
This was echoed by President Biden when he spoke of the pain and exhaustion that black and brown people experience every single day. At the core of these protests is the desire for us all, especially black lives and our minorities, to feel secure and supported. Here locally, we've all walked past a mural at Sullivan's Quay that boldly states Black Lives Matter in direct provision. Never did I think a massive, expressive statement like this would surface so near UCC. To me, it is a symbol of raising awareness that we are all in this together, that together we can unite on the matters that con concern us. It is recognition that Ireland has seen a twofold rise in inward migration that we need to find ways of bridging our divides. Race is well and truly an issue that has been brought into the spotlight here in Ireland. In Pakistan, from where my own parents hail, Nayab Ali, a transgender activist, was recently honoured by the US Embassy for her pride and resilience in dealing with abuse and hate. Nayab's fierce advocacy of transgender rights has brought many accolades, including the Irish Gala International Activist Award in 2020. Pope Francis offered some hope with his words of leaving the judging to God. He wrote recently to the USA-based Jesuit priest who works on LGBTQ inclusion in the church, and it was Pope Francis's words um, to Father James Martin in this handwritten letter, which have been interpreted to be encouraging. And so religion does play a, a, a major role here too, and Muslims are dealing more publicly uh, with issues of sexuality like never before. It would be so much simpler to give a single view of a religion, neatly boxed away, there's comfort in boxes. I often get bored of the Scottish stereotypes presented to me after I tell folks I'm from Glasgow. If only life was kilts and haggis. On the other hand, when I tell folks my parents are from Pakistan, the response is not as jovial. Isn't it interesting how we add values and judgments on entire uh, countries and its people? This is challenging to many who want to hold strongly to their ideal or traditional view. There is no easy answer to sexuality in terms of historical religious traditions. They were written at a time when don't ask, don't tell was not only the Islamic view or Christian view on gender and sexuality, but the lived reality. Times have changed. People are now showing their vibrant colors and each is claiming their authority on a traditional view. From proud gay Muslims to non-kilt wearing Scots, we live at a time where social media gives us the ability to tell our story differently. My friend Fezan took part in Trans Pride London recently, where thousands marched and celebrated. Fezan is also one of the founding members of Iman, the UK's oldest LGBTQ Muslim organization. Over 20 years of helping queer Muslims feel affirmed. A queer Britain museum has recently been established where it holds the clothing Fezan and others wore at a gay pride representing gay Muslims at London Pride over 20 years ago. Reading about Fezan's joy, I began thinking about how complex identities are and how folk like Fezan and Nayab have to deal with Islamophobia, homophobia and transphobia. We are all too aware of the racism that exists in our LGBTQ communities here in Ireland. I advised in a recent national awareness campaign to highlight the racism in Ireland, Proud AF, and a recent report has been published here in Cork, which also details some of the discrimination that LGBTQ people of colour face here. The Crossroads Report by Thomas Heising is one to read. It is a damning report on racism in queer circles. Um, and I quote from his report, Irish participants of colour described lifelong questioning and negation by strangers about their heritage, exhausting, and were mostly focused on this form of othering. The constant invalidating feedback from other Irish people, you are too dark to be Irish, or a denial of their Irishness were frustrating to be met with and were described as happening regularly. Some comments suggest that attitudes of racialization towards Irish people of color are based on what is assumed to be truly Irish, often meaning white. One of the participants described the frustrations of having his Irishness frequently invalidated by men online dating apps as he was not Irish looking. Racism in Ireland seems to center around how people understand geopolitics and global circumstances through media, how television shows and news reports enforce stereotypes political discourse, notions of whiteness, and European su superiority. Examples of the types of interactions related to racialization of other, all of which are paraphrased in this uh, report, talks of a person's skin color so as to make him the butt of a joke. 
um, Alzheimer's uh, rights? Did you fall asleep on a tanning bed in validation of the person's Irishness purely on the basis of having a non-white look? You are too black to be Irish. And one comment phrases the idea of the European white superior civilization as a standing in contrast to all other places. Many of the participants did find themselves forming a reluctance to interact with Cork's white LGBTQ spaces, some actively seeking seclusion from other attitudes. Additionally, some felt that they could not contribute to their community because of the crippling effects of being marginalized or discriminated against. Unfortunately, much of these findings strengthen homonationalism here in Ireland. Homonationalism is the favorable association between a nationalist ideology and LGBT people or their rights. The term was originally proposed by the researcher in gender studies, Jasper Poir, in 2007 to refer to the processes by which powers line up with the claims that the LGBT community, in order to justify racism and xenophobic positions, especially against Muslims, basing them on the prejudices that migrant people are homophobic and that Western society is egalitarian and enlightened. Moving to something more positive. At University College Cork, the Race Equality Forum was established in 2019, an initiative of the Equality Committee and the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Unit, as a way to engage directly with staff and students of color and ethnic minority in the university to draft proposals that would form an embedded program of action for the university. The forum was set up with two co-chairs, one internal and one external, and all participants were of people of color, minority ethnic. Part of this initiative was to hold online live conversations with an audience. These conversations have provided staff and students the opportunity to share their lived experiences of inequality, racism, and other negative experiences in a safe yet open environment. In the aftermath of George, Floyd, George Floyd's death, many Irish black people told their story through social media and news outlets. The Race Equality Forum at UCC held conversations on racism in Ireland, and these conversations raised awareness of the struggles faced by those affected by discrimination and hate, right here at our university and in Cork City. They brought attention to the major problem of racism in Ireland. Through these very personal and emotional conversations, we also become aware of the intersecting discrimination that is not tech book. We heard from a woman of color who was not only receiving discrimination on the basis of her race, but also that she was from a minority Muslim community in Pakistan that is deemed as not Muslim at all. And the story of another woman dealing with stereotypes she faces as an Irish woman whose parents are both Irish and Japanese in her local community. At the core of the work of the forum, which I chair, was the word conversation, because the first step in building coalition and capacity comes from talking to each other and not at each other. We aimed for a bottom-up approach as we invert the top-down approach. Susan Cooper, writing about, the evaluating of the, writing about evaluating the impact of youth work and community work, coined the term participatory evaluation in her 2018 book, where she draws on users of a service to identify themes they would like to discuss. Having a conversation with someone and inequality and injustice is deeply personal and emotional. The first step is to acknowledge the difficulty and discomfort these conversations will bring. And often, one avoids discussions on topics that are understood as contentious, racism being one of them where it becomes so personal and those in conversation want to say the right thing to avoid being perceived as or called out as racist. This is one of the reasons why in combating racism, institutions tend to organize training programs. Such programs typically avoid these personal conversations, creating distance from lived experiences of racism so that the conversation does not become personal and emotional. But the recent conversations that I led during the pandemic have shown that real change comes when we get personal and emotional. There is evidence of mixed results on the delivery of formal courses and programs in terms of raising awareness and education. Through the conversations on racism in Ireland, we aim to bring together people of differing views for uncomfortable but real conversations, to empower our participants and audience through the conversation and action arising as a result of these. And now I move to my conclusion. 
all our social inequalities are connected, a reality made clear through creating intersectional links. Academic discussions do not always highlight real life experience because such experiences are understood as personal. Discrimination is socially created, so we need a social, connected approach to challenging it, which requires joined up thinking and locking arms with those discriminated against. We will create a truly intersectional approach to lived realities through in-person connections, through conversations. While complementing the role played by anti-racism courses and modules, we must shift focus to grounded real-life exchanges and conversations, promoting critical thinking and difficult conversations to determine what practical action point can be set in place to sustain inclusion in the university and wider cityscape. Conversations as a way of challenging and changing minds, attitudes, policies, and behaviors to build more inclusive institutions that celebrate the, and the benefits that diversity brings, brings to our city here in Cork. An outcome of these conversations will enable individuals and our institutions to become critical allies. The need for critical allies has strongly was strongly argued by Emma Dabry in What People Can Do Next, From Allyship to Coalition. A joined up approach which requ requires a productive coalition in partnership with white people and alongside critiques of structural inequalities. Dabry's work is particularly pertinent to beginning critical conversations given her personal experience of growing up black in Ireland as it connects directly to the connectedness of categories of oppression and not just their intersection. The Harvard psychologist Robert Livingston recently wrote a book, The Conversation on How Talking Honestly About Racism Can Transform Individuals and Organizations. It brings an instrumental vision. It acknowledges that some people deny that racism exists, comparing them to a fish that may not notice that they are immersed in water, let alone the dynamics of the stream they live in, because they have become habituated to swimming in a current that has always been there. Perceptions of fairness, then, can be based entirely on habit or history. The conversations I, I led recognize different perspectives, voices, and backgrounds. As part of listening and being in dialogue, we gave recognition to the other, and this is often lacking where hate, prejudice, and intolerance is involved. At a basic level, an individual's self-esteem and realization can grow when they are validated and, recognizes, and recognized, and this in turn boosts self-confidence. In conclusion, Critical conversations are essential. We have a racism problem, that together in conversation we can unite on matters that concern us. That's the thing about diversity, appreciating our differences and living equally side by side in those differences enriches our society. We don't all have to be the same. Space that we share will always be controversial, but if there's anything we should be learning from our recent discussion from pandemics, to isolation, to racism, it is this. Just as we need to accept different identities and ways of living in our society, we all need to feel at home in our spaces, no matter how contested they are. We must let our spaces reflect the values we profess in word and deed. One thing we are learning during this pandemic and its aftermath is that we might all be in this together, but our lived experiences are vastly different. In our world that is often classed uh, the university world as an ivory tower of theories, methods, and convoluted language, conversations have the power to bring people together to discuss their experience of love and hate, raise awareness of the conditions which foster inclusion and exclusion. Homophobia, racism, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, ableism, transphobia, and many others. If we're not joining these dots, there's a problem. In order to build coalitions and capacity by connecting people and groups so we all counter discrimination here in our local Cork with a view of what's happening internationally. So we all counter the discrimination and injustice through speaking with each other critically and honestly as we draw closer in love and kindness and diversity. Thank you. <laughs>